Welcome to another edition, the post-holiday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 525. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's... Oh, good grief. It must be Monday, the 19th of August. <laughs> One of us was on a true holiday. Okay, before we go too far, we do have responsibilities as viewers of this wonderful show to share it, to subscribe to it, to like it on Facebook, like it on YouTube, to subscribe if you've not subscribed. And, you know, if you really don't want to watch our faces as we talk, you can listen to the podcast. That's what we offer here on Unscripted. So I I mentioned holiday. That doesn't mean we all went on holiday together or that we all took holiday, but I use the word holiday because that's the European English term for people when they go on vacation. In the West, we say vacation. I'm booking out my Monday through Friday. I'm telling the boss I'm going on vacation. Well, Gavin, you have no boss, but you took holiday. What did you do? Well, Kevin, when I was a child, I, w- I was a singer. and I, In fact, I'm one of these people who can't stop singing. And um, uh, there was a wonderful time when my I was walking down the street with both my daughters, and I was beginning to sing some Italian opera, as I'm wont to do. And one of them said to the other, doesn't he embarrass you so much? And the other one said, yes, you know how to stop him, don't you? And the little one said, how can you can stop him? Oh, yes, do as I do, said the big one. So the big one and the little one both jumped on my feet as I walked, and I went flat face down on the pavement. And then the big one said, the little one, see, he stopped singing. <laughs> So, genius. <laughs> genius. Um, so I, I've, um, there's a small uh, classical voice singing school where people come together to train uh, um, some, some professional and semi-professional and useless singers. Uh, and I, I've spent a week in Eastbourne um, uh, learning how to sing again. It's been very exciting. That's great. I mean, there's lots of things you can do at our age, you know, that we're into our 50s and 60s, that you can pay to do. I'm a, I love to go bicycling. And I could pay somebody, a, a group, to take me along the Tour de France route after they've gone through. A day later, they allow people who are paying to go on these little tours, like uh, <clears throat> $500 a day, to ride the Tour de France route. Uh, I would never be able to do that. There's, there's hills. Your cities, they have what's called uh, uh, roadway furniture, where all the signs are in the middle of the roadway. Um, just, it, it's interesting what you can do if you have the, the time nowadays. George, how was your time off? Well, I didn't have any time off. Yeah, I know, you worked. <laughs> but you know, it must be opera week at uh, Anglican Unscripted, because Gavin is off in, is it, was it Glinderborn where you were in the opera? Yeah, or Eastbourne? No, 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 Glyndebourne is nearby, but I'm afraid I was the, the peasant's version, Eastbourne. <laughs> you were in Eastbourne. Uh, well, this, we started a new series at church on the, the uh, Christian education on the, on the Grail legends, the Holy Grail, and this Sunday at uh, 9.15, part of the time, we work through the libretto of Parsifal. So while you're singing, uh, Gavin, we're working through uh, Wagnerian librettos at uh, our little church in the swamps here in Florida. You know, up here in the Northeast, if we're going to talk about the Grail, we watched the first Indiana Jones. But all right, whatever you guys want to do. We should move on to the news. I wrote down here in my little uh, outline we need to talk about the National Cathedral, which is here in Washington, D.C., may lose their tax-exempt status. Now, a lot of people out there are like, well, finally. Well, it's interesting who brought this up, George. An organization called Jews Choose Trump filed a complaint with the Internal Revenue Service accusing the National Cathedral Foundation of violating its uh, tax-exempt charter by engaging in active politicking. Recently, the uh, National Cathedral Dean and the Bishop of Washington and one of the canons released a letter that uh, sort of rehashed some liberal democratic talking points about why Trump is a mean person. He says unkind things about the people of Baltimore, so on and so forth. Nothing particularly extraordinary. However, under the U.S. tax code, you're not, religious organizations are not supposed to do this. Now, will the IRS find in favor of the Jewish conservative group or will they find in favor of the Church of the Swamp, the Establishment Cathedral in Washington, D.C. 
I call me skeptical, but I think the National Cathedral is going to still be able to avoid paying sales tax. I remember, and this is back when uh, Bill Clinton was running against George Bush won, uh, the Democratic Party put out a list of things you could say in church and couldn't say in church because they were afraid the religious people would be supporting George uh, Bush at the time. Herbert, you know him very well. You drove him around once. And they were afraid that everybody would come out against uh, uh, candidate Clinton at the time. And they put out this little pamphlet, what you can say and not say in church, because you don't want to come out in support of a candidate. This isn't the first time I've heard of this. Uh, Do you have trouble with uh, politics and churches over there, Gavin? Oh, what, with an established church? Never. Why would we? I thought, I thought there was a vicar who's now in trouble for uh, voicing his political thoughts as a political campaigner. So in, 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 a, in one of our dioceses, a vicar has been chosen as the Brexit candidate. Uh, and, and some time ago, it was against the law for clergy to uh, stand for parliament. They, they've, they've changed the law. Um, his bishop very grumpily said, well, uh, I'll accept that this man wants to do this thing so long as he keeps his promise to me to to keep his right wing views totally detached from his ministry, his parish and the church he's associated with. Now, if he can do that, then, you know, okay. There was no sense of irony at all that 95 percent of the clergy and 100 percent of the bishops fail to keep their left wing views away from their their ministerial commitments. So um, it was a it was an odd thing to read. And and, uh, my jaw dropped and I had to pick it up off the table again. This is well, a, it, go ahead, background, George. Just as a background, the U.S. I don't know if people know this. Churches had for for several for a hundred plus years, churches were allowed to be as political as you wanted to be. And however, in the fifties, uh, Senator Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson of Texas, uh, passed a, a revision, uh, led a revision of the IRS code through Congress, because Johnson would be beaten up by Baptist ministers in Texas for his more progressive viewpoint on that time on race relations, for instance. And it was the Democrats who brought in the, the, uh, the ban on uh, religious speech. And now we're seeing it resuscitated of the conservative Jews bringing, calling for a ban on political speech. Is it, I mean, it's a very interesting issue because a number of our commentators, I mean, our, our critics um, accuse us of being right, right wing. and. Uh, So this brings in a whole series of issues, including what right and left are. I think probably people may not know that that, that for for, for issues of social conscience, I'm really quite left wing. I'm I'm slightly right to center, I think, for economic reasons. But one of the reasons why I think we sound right wing is because the whole uh, impetus of our of our culture at the moment has moved really quite seriously to the left somebody said for example that that boris johnson's cabinet are on the far right actually if you look at their views they're they're dead center for conservatism in the 60s and 70s and and, and 80s here but um as i was reflecting and and preaching my internet sermon on the on this um, week's gospel which is jesus the divider where jesus says i'm going to bring fire and a sword and not peace it gave me a strong sense that that theologically the whole uh, rhetoric of inclusion and tolerance which the left is presenting and isn't isn't true is also about dividing good from evil but it won't tell the truth about what is good and what is evil and in a sense as the left has grown much more powerful and particularly as the left has attacked Christianity just to resist the left uh, is is to appear to be right wing and so I think I want to say to some of our, our, our critics and that, that because we resist the left as they attack Christianity, that doesn't put us on the right. It means we don't like either side attacking Christianity. If, if, um, if there were a group of right-wing uh, identity politics people who cho- chose nationalism instead of power structures, uh, we'd be just as resistant to their ideas. But they don't appear to be out there. They certainly don't appear to have captured the public imagination. Well, this is a great transition then to talk about the roles of Archbishop. Uh, We have the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's going to be doing some traveling in in the near future, going to India. And I thought we could talk about the role of an Archbishop. I always thought was to carry the cross, carry the message of Christ uh, to wherever he goes, to be a person who uh, props up the church, 
Uh, and it seems like, and I, I know people remember this when Obama became president many years ago, that he went on his apology tour. Uh, it's horrible that America did these things. It's horrible that white America did these things. Um, I'm sorry for America. And I'm seeing a little bit of that in the last six years from Justin Welby. He's apologizing for the church. He's apologizing for uh, the imperialism. And I thought we could talk about his upcoming visit to India, where the, Christ the Christians there are truly being persecuted by the, the Hindus. In fact, Martin Bashir is the new BBC religious affairs correspondent. Mm -hmm. uh, he made his name with the scoop of an interview with Princess Diana some time ago. Okay. Uh, Martin is a practicing Christian. Uh, and we had an exchange of emails during my uh, exciting uh, media outlet as I criticized the Helter Skelter in Norwich Cathedral. And one of the things as we talked uh, about Lambeth was Martin's frustration as a journalist that when he went to uh, a, a journalistic briefing at Lambeth Palace. Uh, he asked whether or not the Archbishop, when he went to India, was going to speak out on behalf of this enormously serious, intense persecution of Christians at the hands of their Muslim neighbours, and was told that the Archbishop was not going to do that, uh, that, that this was not an appropriate occasion. Um, and um, I, I, I won't I'll let Martin speak for himself, but, but he was profoundly disappointed by the approach of Welby's staff and what Welby was going to do. And, and I share his disappointment. And I'm afraid I think I, think I share his disgust. I think there comes a point where uh, even though international affairs are complex and diplomacy is an ever convoluted process in which you run the risk of losing your, your soul, there are points when an archbishop in particular has an overriding responsibility to stand with the Christians. Indeed, that's what I understand the second half of Matthew 25 to be about. I, I, it, you know, it's not about social distress primarily. It's about coming to the aid of the naked, hungry and imprisoned Christians who are suffering for their witness for Jesus. And in this case, the Archbishop may have to some explaining to do on the last day. They, the Archbishop of Canterbury is uh, told staff told reporters the Archbishop wasn't going to do politics when he went to India. And the pro problems facing the churches in India right now are twofold. Uh, increasing levels of persecution of Christians, uh, primarily in India by Hindu nationalists, Pakistan by Muslims, of course. But Christians are under a great deal of political, social, and economic pressure. In small villages, we read time and again of a Christian family forced from their home, the daughter raped, the son murdered, because they won't uh, worship at the Hindu temple or take part in the local rites. That Christians are being singled out. In an Orissa state, there was a massacre several years ago that the, that the state government has still not gotten around to doing anything about to investigate. Well, the Archb and so we have Christian persecution. At the same time, the Anglican, uh, the United Churches of India, Church of North India, Church of South India, are mired deeply in financial corruption. Recently, the Bishop of Calcutta was bounced out of his job and is now facing trial. There are half a dozen criminal investigations of bishops from uh, Bombay down throughout South India. The former primate of, or moderator of the Church of South India is under active criminal investigation for massive fraud. And the reputation of the Church of South India is that it's a dirty church. And Justin Welby, facing Christian persecution and a crisis of Christian leadership is going to go to India and mark the 100th anniversary of the Amritsar massacre where in 1919 some Gurkhas under General Dyer uh, tried, to put, uh, tried to break up a uh, pro-independence rally and killed and many people were killed. And Justin Welby is going to apologize deeply, humbly, on behalf of the British Empire for the ills done by the Gurkha troops against their uh, neighboring South Asian peoples. Now, this is, this is buffoonery on a high level. Justin Welby apologizing for something that was done 100 years ago by the British government, not even by the church, uh, is pure politics. It's part of the Indian... See, right now in India, there's a, the BJP, the 
the uh, Hindu Nationalist Party in power is trying to say all problems in Indian life are due to the British colonial empire and era. And now Welby is playing into the hands of the BJP by basically carrying forth their banner that the reasons why people are poor is because of the British. The reasons why we have corruption is because of the British. The reason why we have religious strife is because of the British. And Welby is not going to do politics when he's in India. Hmm. Now, the man is either a colossal buffoon or he has no integrity. And he's just basically going to... Uh, so you're, you're saying you, well, uh, you see, you're saying he can't be both. I do know why he's going. On one level, he's going to India, and then he's going to the Council of Christian Churches of Asia because he wants the Anglican churches of Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, Papua New Guinea, so on and so forth, as well as Indian churches, to come to the Lambeth Conference. He wants to save face and not look like a total jackass and have the Lambeth be a fiasco. So that's part of the reasons why he's going out there. But as his role as a Christian leader, he's abdicated that totally, totally. There's such a vacuum out there of Christian leadership that the Archbishop of Canterbury has, cho has caused. Well, I, Justin Welby is one political operative now in the Anglican Church, but I'm watching the Archbishop of Hong Kong, and I would say he's the master of politics. He is somehow... Early on, he took the the Chinese side in, in this Beijing side. side. What's that? The commie, the commie side. Then he took the protester side. Then he said, "I didn't mean to take the protester side that much, but I certainly don't want to take the 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 commie yeah, side." And human, and over the last week backside. and a half, he's found the middle way. Well, the human backside is designed to sit on the fence. He's and on the, the fence. Is, is a perfect example of the. God's wisdom in designing human anatomy. After having been against the protests and having condemned the protesters as being selfish and childish, what's going on in Hong Kong is that the Peking, don't say Beijing, say Peking, please, just humor me. The Peking government Gosh, is seeking to underdo, undo all the guarantees that were set in place for the special territory of Hong Kong set up in 1997. They wanted to get rid of that one country, one set of laws, one set of political organizations. So Hong Kong is losing its independence. And the spark has been the Chinese government able to extradite people from Hong Kong to the mainland and try them for political crimes. We've had protests now for several months that the Archbishop of Hong Kong, the Anglican one, has been thoroughly in the pocket of the Peking government. He's a, he's a functionary. He's part of the uh, an executive advisory board set up of wise leaders. He's just received a medal from the Peking appointed government in Hong Kong for his service to the state. And he was saying, you know, these selfish protesters need to be quiet and, and sit down and uh, follow the wise teachings of our leaders in Peking. Well, perhaps he finally got religion. Perhaps his other bishops in, Peking, in Hong Kong said, you know, we really are on the wrong side here. And the bishops of Hong Kong, with the archbishop at the head, signed a letter saying, decrying violence on both sides. Not address. It, here's an example of the... Now, the Roman Catholic Church has got a terrible reputation because of what Francis did in selling out the underground church. Mm -hmm. But the Roman Catholic Church in Hong Kong has stood in the forefront, in the vanguard of leadership in pro-democracy, pro-human rights, pro-civil society leadership. And it's a really a sad day when a stooge of the Peking government is the chairman of the Anglican Consultative Council and is the voice of Anglicanism in China. And this man, I, I don't know, how can one be, over, be more overcome with disdain than I am with Justin Welby? Well, Paul Kuang, you, you top that too. Well, here, the interesting thing to me is when we started the show six, seven years ago, uh, the fastest growing church was the Chinese church. And they were just brave enough to start building churches. It, they were no longer an underground church. They were coming out from underground and they were getting some support and less persecution. And all of a sudden, in the last 14 months, the Chinese government has absolutely shut them down. They knock down the crosses, they burn the churches, and says, you are no longer allowed to do anything. There was a story out of northern China where they're just doing re-education camps for uh, Christian pastors and teachers where you have to be a party person. 
you have to be part of the Chinese Communist Party if you want to be a pastor. What I think is extraordinary is that the Chinese in the in the Western China that they the Uyghurs are a Muslim minority in China who are the majority of the population in the Western parts of China on the border of Kazakhstan and Russia, and the Chinese government are seeking to uh, essentially engage in a genocide. They've set up camps where there are estimated millions of people. Children are separated by their families. They're basically being taught to renounce their religion, renounce their culture. They're being turned into little Han Chinese. And the Archbishop of Hong Kong has been silent about the persecution of Chinese Muslims. Now, what, uh, was it Pastor Niemöller, or I think it was Niemöller, who said, first they came for the trade unionists, sure. and I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, I wasn't a Jew, and then they came for me. This is what's happening in China. I mean, the the Chinese government believes that they, a greater immediate threat lies in the threat of Islam, but they're also ratcheting up the pressure on Christianity. The Christians no longer may have Sunday schools. Children may not worship in Christian churches. Children may not go to summer camps run by the church. And it's going to get, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And the Chinese Anglican Church in Hong Kong is just doing a Rodney King. Why can't we all get along in peace, love, and happiness? Mm. We never talked about Pakistan, India, either. We'll do that next week when we have our show. Um, you know, good show, guys. I thought maybe after uh, two weeks down with, or, uh, you know, I guess, was it seven weeks? Seven, seven days? I don't know. That we would have lost the chemistry. I think we still got it, guys. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 525 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>